to Beyond Herding Cats, project management in a small agency. Um, whether you yourself are a project manager in a small agency or you're a PM in a big agency who's managing a small team, perhaps you're a freelancer who's project managing themselves, or you're a developer or designer trying to learn to live with a PM without hating them, this will hopefully be a good session for you. <laughs> Um, this session really came out of feeling like most project management resources and education were geared towards large companies. As someone who doesn't work at a large company myself, the challenges I was seeing in my day to day were not being reflected in the materials I was finding. So I decided to work on creating some resources out of those experiences. This is very much going to be a lessons learned session, so a lot of these are mistakes that I've made um, trying to adapt project management for a small agency. Um, so my name is Tori Lewis. You can find me on Twitter at Tori Lewis Writes. And if you have any questions after the session or you have some tips that I've missed, please reach out to me. I divide my time between two different small agencies. Fibonacci Web Studio is a group that focuses on research and higher education websites and apps. At this agency, I'm director of projects. So I'm the lead PM and content strategy expert, but also part of our sales and marketing efforts, as well as a frequent dabbler in code and design. Rooted is my other agency, and they're a full-service agency devoted to nonprofits. And at Rooted, I fo solely focus on project management. Part of the reason that I'm bringing up my background is that while every small agency feels very different, there are strategies that can be adapted to all of these environments. Um, while the two companies I work for are very, very different, they still allow me to use many of the same skills and tools that I believe that can be adopted for most small agencies. Cats. Um, so beyond herding cats, a former colleague used to talk about managing content editors specifically as herding cats. For those of you who might not have heard that idiom before, basically imagine trying to move a whole bunch of cats in the same direction. Um, it's hard and it's really frustrating and ultimately cats have a mind of their own. While I don't think that this metaphor is great for the whole of project management, I do think the skill set that's required for project management is kind of like animal training. Let's go with animal training at a circus. Um, <laughs> you have a lot of incredibly diverse and talented teammates, and your job is to manage them so that your team can make a more cohesive whole. The most common animals we see in small development, or small agency web development, are one, lone wolves. Most web developers who opt to go into small agency see themselves as lone wolves. They like building perhaps in a small team or in pairs, but often alone, and giving them a clear goal is the best way to manage them. Next, you have cats, and your cats are basically your clients. Um, they have a lot of competing priorities, and getting them to focus on their web project can be kind of like herding cats. The next person you'll see at a small agency is a mama bear. Small agencies often have a couple team members who try to do everything themselves. Um, they're strong and capable, but they often have difficulty delegating. Obviously, this is mostly a silly analogy, um, and no one person fits into each category perfectly. But like an animal trainer, your job as project manager, especially at a small agency, is getting to know each member of your team so that you and your role can support them individually and help the team to put on, to continue the metaphor, a great show. I promise that I'll stop using animal metaphors, uh, but as an English literature graduate, I can't resist beginning with a good or a bad circus analogy at bad camp. <laughs> so the first tip I have on the practical side is to be agile even if you're not agile. Trying to adopt a full agile methodology when you're working in a team of two or three can elicit serious groans from developers who've been burned before. I've heard these groans before and they're not really great to be on the receiving end of. Uh, developers at small agencies want to maintain the reason that they often move to small agencies to begin with, which usually includes things like fluidity, individual ownership, flexibility, and some sort of room to play. Um, they often value being agile with a lowercase a over being agile with a capital A. You could try to implement full scrum at a small agency, and if you do, please be sure to blog about it and send me the link. Um, but 
I've found that it works better to adopt some practices from a lot of different project management philosophies and keep changing along with you and your agency. Now, if you are full scrum, you'll probably be thinking that I'm blasphemous right now, so just like cover your ears for the next like minute. Um, daily stand-ups can be really great, but what if you have part-time freelancers who don't work with your team every day? Um, sometimes bi-weekly stand-ups can be a better option. Um, what if your project only involves one member of your team? Um, an occasional brainstorming session with the team can often be better than a daily stand-up because they're the only one that's really owning that project. Weekly sprints might not work if you're a small agency that takes on projects that take less than a week. Um, <laughs> And also, in a small agency, do you even have enough people to have both a product owner and a scrum master? Often you don't, and so there's ways to combine those roles. One thing that I do consider sacred, um, but you might not, everyone has their different sacrednesses, um, but I find a project debrief or postmortem to be very sacred within the Agile methodology. Every project brings with it lessons, and although one singular project may not make or break your small agency, not learning from that project where everyone had a lot of challenges can make or break a small agency. Ultimately, trying to adopt wholesale a single methodology goes against our circus training metaphor. Uh, each team is comprised of different people and different methods will help them use their skills best. You don't lion train the same way that you bear train. Not that I would know. Uh, your job as project manager at a small agency is not to manage individual projects, but to manage the agency's process so that each project is managed in a way that is more suited to the context each time. <laughs> now let's talk meetings. Meetings for two to three people who work together all the time can feel like the Wild West. Anything goes, let's just rush in, guns blazing. And while I hate to break it to all the Spaghetti Western fans in the room, this is a mistake. It's certainly tempting. You know each other's rhythms, you can read each other's minds, finish each other's sentences, and you might as well hit the ground running. But this is a surefire way to get all turned around on your horse. So let's do a quick and dirty meetings 101 for small teams. Like with Agile, there's no need for formality for formality's sake. Um, but there are a few cardinal rules when running meetings for small groups that will save you a lot of time and headaches in the long run. My first tip is to have an agenda. Um, don't assume you'll remember everything you need to talk about because you won't. Um, I find a quick bullet pointed list is usually enough for small teams. It's great to share in advance, but having it up on a screen share or a whiteboard during the meeting can work well as well. Um, if everyone knows what the map ahead looks like, you're less likely to lose the trail. The second tip is related and, and that's time boxing. Um, once you have an agenda, make sure that you can actually cover it in the allotted time. No one wants a one hour meeting that turns into an hour and a half. So give an estimate for how long it will take to cover each item and then keep an eye on the clock. The third tip is to take things offline. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever worked in a corporate office, you will probably roll your eyes at the idea of saying, can we take this discussion offline? Um, it's certainly a bit of cliche in the office world, but it can be a very helpful tool. The idea of taking things offline is basically the difference between replying all and replying on an email thread. Let's say you're in a meeting with a designer, a PM, and two developers. A good conversation offline is a highly technical discussion of an API. Now, I highly recommend ac against actually using the let's offline this terminology. A lot of people who've worked in big offices before, that's like a trigger word. <laughs> it's some manager's way of saying, stop talking. Um, instead, I recommend getting into that conversation and saying, hey, developer X and developer Y, seems like this would be a great thing to have a more in-depth conversation about it. Um, why can you put it on your to-do list to follow up and schedule something? Everyone will appreciate that you're respecting their time, and X and Y will still have the opportunity to hash out a problem. In a small agency, 15 minutes of the designer's time in that meeting listening to something they don't understand about APIs is very expensive to your bottom line. Number four on my list of meeting tips is to not ignore the niceties. This is especially important for remote workers, of which small agencies often comprise. But all small teams can benefit from a bit of small talk. 
give yourself a little breathing room at the beginning and the end of the meeting to catch up on your weekends, share costume ideas, brag or commiserate about non-work exploits. Fostering team morale is always important and it's really easy to ignore the idea of company culture when you're working with a small group, but a little bit of bonding in each meeting can go a very long way. And my last tip is that everyone should walk out of the meeting with a to-do list. Every decision made needs to be documented and acted upon. There are a couple different strategies of doing this. The first is that everyone can individually document their own to-do list and share this out at the end of, the end of this meeting and ideally the beginning of the next meeting. Alternatively, you as the project manager can take notes on all the action items and send out a group email after the check-in. But my personal favorite method of making a to-do list in a meeting is to use your project management software. On my teams, we all use Asana, and as we go through different issues in the meeting, I'm there creating and updating tasks in the system, assigning each one to an, in, an individual team member and adding a due date. This is great because you're not actually adding any additional steps to your workflow where people are having to follow up after the meeting with a to-do list. You're just updating your project tracker, which you're going to have to do after the meeting anyway. Um, Everyone can see what decisions are made on project management software, and if someone isn't in the meeting, you can still assign tasks to them, hopefully with a little note saying who they can follow up with with questions or for details. What if I only have one developer? Surprise. All of the above rules still apply when you have one developer. Um, Regular one-on-one -on -one meetings between the PM and the sole developer still require some sort of structure. So you should come in with an agenda and leave with a to-do list. You should be respectful of their time by time boxing and ensuring that follow-up meetings are scheduled if specific issues need to be discussed in depth. It's really easy to get sidetracked because you're like, we're the only two people that need to talk about X, so let's just do it in our weekly check-in. But then you neglect a lot of things that you needed to talk about in your weekly check-in. So more in-depth conversations should have dedicated meetings. Spend some time chatting casually and personally with your developer and keep that lone wolf happy and well prepared for the work ahead. Next thing I wanna talk about is remote project management. Um, while not all remote teams are small and not all small teams are remote, there is often an overlap and managing remote teams requires that you focus on communication, collaboration, and culture in a very intentional way. And so while the techniques might be different, the core competencies are the same whether your team works in an office or around the world. Perhaps the biggest challenge for remote teams and for most teams is communication. Um, when you can't walk down the hallway and chat face to face when there's a misunderstanding, the making sure that misunderstandings don't happen is way more important. Um, so let's make sure that we all understand each other. To begin, I want to talk about communication channels. It's important when you're working remotely and in any office setting to choose your communication channel wisely. It's 2018 and there are a ton of tools available for remote communication. So I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each, each option. The first is Slack. Um, Slack is gaining popularity rapidly. It's pretty popular amongst most developers I work with. And for a lot of very good reasons. It's very quick. You can jot off a message and receive a response um, before you're even like done getting a drink. Um, it's fun. If you haven't installed Giphy on your Slack yet, um, you need to do that immediately after this meeting. <laughs> and in addition to Giphy, you can react with fun emojis, you can share memes, songs, YouTube videos, etc., etc. It feels way less formal than email and it can function as basically a water cooler. Um, additionally, anyone can jump in on the conversation. If I just email Elliot and Theo has the answer to the question that I'm asking, I might miss out on that help because I've emailed Elliot because I think he knows what I'm talking about. Um, so it's helpful to post on Slack because anyone who's involved in the project can jump in if they have the answer. There are some cons to Slack. Um, one of the primary ones that I've seen is that if your team doesn't pay for the premium option, which in small agencies can be a cost that you're not willing to deal with, messages will disappear after some time. So there's not like a great record of like decision making processes. Um, Slack also advantages whoever happens to be online when the conversation is happening. 
So if it's really important that Jane is involved in the conversation and Jane's at lunch when we're trying to decide what module to use, like we might start going in the wrong direction because we happen to talk about it on Slack at noon and Jane always has lunch at noon. Um, the next um, communication tool that, pro that um, project managers should use with remote teams is email. Um, the pros of email are that it feels official and formal. It's kind of the anti-Slack. It's clearly a winner for Slack for like more serious documentation, um, such as sharing the scope of work on a project or a contract. And it's also great for communicating with clients. I don't know if anyone's tried to onboard clients to their Slack team, but it's it can be difficult. Um, so it's nice to communicate with clients via email. It's what they're comfortable with usually. Um, and following up on that, everyone knows how to use email. If you've worked with someone who's resistant to Slack, um, you might know from experience that email is a better way to communicate with those less technologically inclined folks. Um, email's also fundamentally asynchronous. While Slack can be asynchronous, it often feels of the moment, whereas email is fundamentally asynchronous. While certainly some people um, like to be exceptions to this rule, no one can really expect you to instantaneously reply to an email. There are cons to email, and I feel like telling a room full of people the cons of email is like a stand-up act waiting to happen. Um, but everyone hates email. Um, you don't need to, me to tell you why email isn't always the best method of communication. My theory is that the reason everyone hates email is because they've worked at a company where no one has listened to this bad camp talk with all of the other options for remote collaboration. Um, overuse of email makes opening an inbox frustrating. People use email for everything from a quick ping to a full on discussion and most of these uses can be better handled by something else on this list. The third communication option is text messages, which isn't a super popular one, but I think there are a lot of pros. Um, in 2018, everyone responds to text pretty quickly. Texts are great for reminding people about a call that they're 10 minutes late to and seem to have forgotten, or telling people that you're 10 minutes late to a call because you forgot about it. Um, it's also great for letting someone know there's an urgent issue on the site. Um, people who snooze their Slack notifications or their email might respond to a text. Um, the cons is that it's not a super professional method of communicating, um, and not everyone takes kindly to their project manager texting them at midnight, telling them that the site is down. Um, so your mileage may vary, but if you work for a more formal team, tread lightly here. If your team's super informal, text messaging might be a great way for those more urgent messages to get shared. Project management software is the next tool. Um, again, I think very highly of Asana, but there are so many tools out there that trying to list them would take me the rest of this session. I like to think of project management software as the project manager's version of a text editor. Like everyone has their opinions, there's a ton of options, and trying to convince someone that likes Basecamp to use Asana is better done over beers than here in the session today. Um, so I'm sure that you have a project management software that you love. Um, they all work pretty similarly. They all have similar features. Um, they all share some pros as a remote communication tool. One is that they're built to keep you on task. As fun as Slack is, it's really easy for a conversation to devolve to a completely different subject. Project management software is built around project tasks and deliverables, and it reminds everyone like what we're supposed to be talking about. Additionally, notifications are very customizable. Um, maybe on a development task, I want to know everything, but on a design task, I just want to know if someone's mentioning me, um, and I can make that work for me, but someone who wants to be notified about every little thing on the project can do that too. Um, in project management software, you can include all your files and links very easily, sync to Dropbox and Drive, so everyone has the most updated version of the document, um, making sure that everyone has what they need to do what they need to do. Additionally, and this is a big pro for me, is that you can integrate your project management tool with your time tracking tool. Um, Asana is our project management tool and Harvest is our time tracking tool and we've integrated them, um, which means that if I'm working on a task in Asana and talking about it, I can automatically make sure that that time is tracked and then I'm billing it to the right client and that I'm being compensated fairly for that time. 
I know that I personally am guilty of looking at Slack and email without like clocking in and that there's a ton of lost time from just like checking in on communication issues. There are cons to relying on Asana or your project management software as your communication tool. Um, because everyone can set those individual notification preferences, you can never be 100% sure if people are seeing the conversation. Um, also, project management tools do often have built-in chat rooms uh, for general conversations, but I haven't seen those used effectively very often. Um, I find Slack to be a better method for like general chit chat, whereas project management software is better when you're talking about specific tasks. Um, there's also a barrier to entry with project management softwares. Um, obviously, most of your teams that are pretty technical will pick this up quickly, um, but trying to onboard a client to Asana, we've done it, and sometimes it works really well with our more technical clients, and sometimes our clients would rather just email me all of their issues all the time. Um, so it's something to keep in mind about relying on that software. Additionally, if you don't have someone monitoring and cleaning up your instance, it can quickly become a mess and an overload of information. I've seen people create duplicate tasks for the same issue, sometimes up to five tasks for the exact same issue. I've also seen people try to build an entire admin interface and a single Asana task. Um, so setting norms and enforcing them is really critical to using the software effectively. And I also recommend like at least a couple times a week to go in there and just clean things up, delete all those duplicate tasks, make sure that things are broken up appropriately and organized appropriately. The next three methods for remote communication have similar pros and cons, and in some ways are just progressive versions of getting more personal and more in depth with your communication. So the first of those is a phone call. Phone calls are very well suited to full discussions and conversations. On the phone, you can hear the tone of voice and the inflection. The cons of a phone call is it takes a really long time. Calling you on the phone is gonna take way longer than shooting off a Slack message, um, and we might get caught up in chatting about other things. Um, on the phone, it can also be hard to tell if everyone on the call is fully engaged. Um, when you're on a conference call and someone mutes themselves and then takes like 10 seconds to unmute themselves to respond, and you're like, I don't know if you weren't listening to me or if you were actually muted. Um, you also don't know if someone's checking their email, if someone's listening to you, unless they're actually speaking, you have no idea who on the line is paying any attention. So the next one of these is a video call. Um, so in addition to all the pros of the phone call, you can also see people's facial expressions, which allows you to tell if they're actually being engaged. It's really obvious if someone's checking their email during a video call, um, and you can kindly call them in. <laughs> um, Video calls are also very well suited for sensitive or emotional conversations. Like if you're talking about a staffing change or reviewing someone's performance, it's very nice to have that on a video call. It feels way more personal than a phone call and <coughs> worst of all, an email about your performance. Um, no one likes that. Um, video calls are also great for kickoff calls. Um, it lets everyone get to know each other by seeing each other's faces and chatting in a way that feels more personal than just being on a conference call. The last method of remote communication is in-person meetings, which seems contradictory to the idea of being remote, but if several team members are based in the same geographic area, it can be nice to occasionally meet in person. Um, it's a great way to run a brainstorming session, um, and a team building retreat is also a great way to boost company culture. Additionally, if you're connecting with a client for the first time and they are in the general geographic area of at least one of your team members, it's really nice to send that person there um, to be able to meet in person, do the whole handshake thing. As a remote team, it's great to not have to commute to your client every day, but it's also nice to occasionally see them face to face. It goes a long way towards building rapport. Some other important communication tips to keep in mind is to know what time zones everyone is on. Um, if someone's traveling, make sure that they send out a Slack message telling you what their new time zone is so you don't try to schedule them for midnight calls. Um, it's also really helpful to have like a default time zone. Um, so if you're talking amongst yourselves internally, and for instance, 
most of our team is based in California, but not everyone. So when we're talking internally, if we say 3 p.m., the assumption is it's 3 p.m. PSD, um, unless we're more specific. Um, Another tip is to err on the side of being more clear than you need to be. I used to say err on the side of over communicating, but I think that that implies more about the volume of communication than the quality of the communication. It's not about saying the same thing over and over, but making sure that the quality and clarity of what you're saying is really critical when someone is remote. Um, regularly checking in with your team to make sure that these communication strategies are actually working for them is really important. If you notice that someone's never responding to the Slack channel, make sure that they have their notifications turned on or that, oh, I actually don't have Slack on my phone, I hate it, can you send me an email instead if it's important. Um, additionally, make sure that your team is actually checking Asana, that they're completing their tasks, marking things off. Um, whatever communication strategies you're trying to employ, make sure that they're actually being employed. Um, also know that communication is a skill and that part of your role as project manager is to teach that to your team. Share new features from your Slack or your project management software. Show someone how to use a Gmail tool that you really like or introduce them to helpful plugins. Um, I remember introducing someone to the time management integration where you can integrate your time tool with project management software. They were blown away and made their life way easier. And so that's really helpful to make sure that people are being taught these skills. I would say at least once a month, try to add a new layer to your team's competencies in terms of communication. The next important tenet is collaboration. It's a huge cornerstone of your workflow. Um, collaboration is really about obviously working together. And when it comes to working remotely, we can't all sit in the same room and whiteboard things out. Um, so we can't all pour over the same document. Um, we don't have access to the same network, so we can't just share things among our office network. So there are some tools that I have found really helpful for collaboration in a remote team. And I also, after I go through the tools that I really like, I'm gonna invite everyone to share out their favorite tools because this is like the most exciting thing to me um, is the tools that allow us to do our jobs better that we might not have seen before. So the first is Google Drive. Um, I know that there are alternatives to Google Drive, um, but in my opinion, Google Drive is the holy grail of like collaborating on documents. Um, the commenting functionality, the ability to edit simultaneously, the automatic save feature, um, it's way harder to work together from afar if you don't have something like Google Drive. Second is Gather Content, which I'm actually going to show you. Um, Gather Content is designed for content authoring. Um, you can, oh, just pull it up. This is one of our Gather Content instances. So the first thing is that you can create, I might be able to this right. There we go. So you can create templates. So for this project, we have a video content type. And in the video content type, we have a couple fields. One is the byline, one is the embed code, and one is the description. Um, you can add help text here to help all of your content editors figure out, you know, what do you mean by byline? What do you mean by description? Do you want 150 words? Do you want two words? Um, and once you've set up a template, you can start adding content. So here in the content tab, I can create a new piece of content and I can apply any of my templates that I've already set up. So this is great if you're building a new site and your development team hasn't finished the back end yet, but you need to start figuring out content. So you can enter all your fields and you can create as much content as you want. And then there's also this status field, which is great. Um, so in the status field, you have a lot of options. So not populated yet is if you're just kind of building out a site map, and you have drafting, copy review and testing, editing, approval, legal, legal review, et cetera. Not all of these will be relevant for every project. It's really helpful to run kind of the content through the, up the ladder as it will, were. Um, 
as I said before, content editors are like cats. You're hurting them all the time. And I found this to be a great tool for hurting the cats. Uh, we actually just found this kind of recently and we're in love with it and it's been really helpful. Um, another thing that's great about this tool is that there are automatic feeds. So you can feed this tool into a WordPress or Drupal site. So if you're building things out here, you can just feed it through to your site as opposed to copy and pasting if someone's drafting in Google Drive or in Word or something like that. There's also this great project status, so if you have a certain amount of content and you're marking it appropriately in the status field, you can actually see the visual of what's happening. You have the recent activity. It's a really great tool that I've really enjoyed getting to know, and I find clients really, really like this as opposed to having to go into a Drupal site that's not fully built out, doesn't have a theme yet, is kind of just in the early stages. It can stress people out a little bit, whereas this interface can be really helpful. Uh, the next tool is called Real-Time Board. Real-Time Board lets you basically play with stickies and brainstorm visually and virtually. It's gonna take forever a little. Uh, so we use it a lot for like sitemaps and information architecture. You can just move stickies around. Your board can be as big or small as you want to. And then it's literally just like playing with stickies. Um, so if you're building out a sitemap and you want to move things around, you can do that. There's different color stickies. There's a lot of different options. Um, the next option is whiteboard, spelled W-I-T-E board, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's a whiteboarding tool for virtual teams. Um, it's basically the closest you can get to whiteboarding without having to be in the same room. It's great if you're on a video conference call or a conference line where you can share your screen and you, someone's on whiteboard and they're just sharing their screen and they're writing things down and whiteboarding out a problem. We also like using Dropbox. Um, the benefit to Dropbox over something like Google Drive is it keeps documents more organized, I found. Um, Google Drive has a lot of great functions in terms of trying to send you up things that you might be wanting, um, but Dropbox is organized according to exactly how you want it. There's no algorithm at play trying to show you things that it thinks you want to see. Um, it's also really easy for access and sharing, um, and some people's Google Drives in their organization, if you have a Google organization for your agency, you have your Google Drive kind of shut down, so you can't share out documents that you're working on with clients, whereas Dropbox, you can set the permissions separately. So it's kind of nice to have two different instances. One is working and one is sharing. And I find Dropbox to be better for the sharing. The permissions management is a lot easier in Dropbox. And obviously there are many more tools um, for virtual and a remote collaboration. And I'm always looking for more to add to my bag of tricks. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and ask anyone who has a tool that they wanna share to share the name of that tool and maybe a website or something that we can go to um, to check it out. I use Lucid Charts. Lucid Charts? What does that do? It's, it's like online Visio. So you can do project management stuff, um, BCNM, um, switch <coughs> tools and all that other stuff as well as uh, workflow, um, charts. There's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's free and it's online and you don't have to install anything. Well, free and online and no install sounds really great <laughs> to me um, for that much functionality. Trello. Trello. What's your favorite part about Trello? Every post, you can add a lot of content, comments, files. You can move it easily. Yeah. I've heard really great things about Trello, and I've never adopted it. Very close to Asana. Yeah.
and I'm air table air table and I'm gonna repeat that for the um, recording um, they were saying air table they use it for content as well as now they're using it for user stories on their team um, I work for a larger somewhat larger nonprofit and we use confluence as oh. an internal wiki mm. capturing all kinds of uh, <clears throat> That's interesting. The idea of confluence as an internal wiki. You have to check that out. I've never heard of that before. That That's sounds great. awesome. Um, the tool is bug heard, and you can put a pin where the bug is on your site. Yeah. Automatically creates a Kanban board for you. Yeah. So I'm trying to get that to push to a Santa, and I haven't got that one. Yeah. That's kind of like the next yeah. step, so we don't have everybody like, like all the developers yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I feel like bugs in context is a really hard thing to figure out how to manage because people will send you like, oh, this isn't working. And I'm like, I need to see, like, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It does a screenshot and it records what their browser resolution is, what browser they use. And oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Also, uh, for doing mockups, well, it's called mockups, but with a Q. So, so we'll use that for content. I mean, we'll share out notes from this um, with links. I'll add in links to all of these fun tools so you guys can check them out. Um, great. Um, that was very helpful. Does anyone else have any tools that they want to share before we move on? I'd be interested in hearing people's comments on using Basecamp. Does anyone use Basecamp? Has anyone successfully used Basecamp or unsuccessfully I, used Basecamp? I, I successfully left Basecamp after paying for my Basecamp for like six years and not oh, wow. using it. But I was like, it had all my passwords and notes mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out how to get them out. So I got my son to, for, as a summer job, move everything over into so I can shut it down, so I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Our small program is a system that is using the for grade 9 for to get back to that Interesting. 
Did he see a hand up here for a base camp? Oh yeah, we well, we don't use base camp at CSUB directly, but we do use it with our vendors. So we have um, a client account with them, and our experience or my experience with base camp has been pretty positive. I mean, every um, we have a whiteboard, we have a file section for file uploads, uh, messaging. Um, we can tag people in our. Uh, in our messages or in our in our projects just as easily and just like Asana it has a to-do list that we can break down into weeks um, on what needs to be done and what we finished so the only thing I haven't seen it do, uh, do is maybe create burn down charts mm -hmm. but other than that we're we're very happy as far as uh, knowing what we need to do for our upcoming sprints and uh, what we need to talk about for our weekly uh, retrospective meetings. Thank you. Go. I'm also in this base camp, but it's not, a lot of times my client is already using it, so I would mm -hmm. just put it out there that if your client already has a tool that they're really comfortable with, then that may be a good choice because then you don't have to start forcing them to get used to using it. Yeah, that's no, very true. Yeah, and we do the same thing. We're on a sauna as a company, but we have clients, if they're in base camp, we just work with them there um, a lot of the time because it's easier for them to administrate it there and they're giving, it's a client that gives us a lot of production tasks so they can manage it on their side much easier. But I was on base camp at the company I was at previously and it was a team of six and moving from base camp to Asana when I switched companies, Asana is so much easier from my standpoint to manage. At least, it's a bigger company. It's I think it's way easier to communicate in this lab and test stuff out and see where your projects are at. And if you are semi agile, it's easier to like build up your sprints and things like that. So yeah. I like it. Yeah. That's interesting. I've had good experiences with Basecamp, um, but I do find it to be very pricey for what it is, given that there are a lot of free softwares out there that offer similar features. But like if a client were on Basecamp and they're paying for that, I, I'll get on Basecamp any day. Um, yeah, so thank you all for sharing all those tools and um, I'm glad that we just got into that great discussion because now we're at almost noon, um, which is great because I find the tools conversation to not happen as often among project managers as it does among developers and I think that we have a lot of tools that we can use as well and it's, it's nice to share those out. Um, I have a question. Go for it. Um, does anyone have any experiences with uh, Microsoft Project? Is it, is it, you like it, or? It's, it's a good thing. I don't know about this expensive. Mm -hmm. In this version of the market, it's a double price. Oh, wow, okay. In the previous version, it's a problem. I wasn't sure if it was like um, SharePoint, where you can get a, you know, a client and a server, or if there are any other tools out there that do the exact same thing that are free or even web-based where I don't have to install it. Sometimes I'm on a machine that doesn't, that has non-Microsoft, so I don't want to be limited by yeah. you know, what operating system I'm on. I don't use SharePoint because it's a very expensive tool. Yeah. And using it for the size of the files that you Yeah, yeah. 
There are a lot of great project management softwares that cost a lot of money. <laughs> so hopefully some of these free tools um, will be helpful. Um, it is noon. Um, I'm just going to leave you with one final joke, <laughs> which is that being a project manager at a small agency often requires wearing a lot of hats, but luckily project managers are known for looking very good at hats. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your Saturday and rest of your bad camp. And please reach out to me on Twitter if you want to talk about anything more. Share some cool links to tools or blog posts or anything like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. I've got a question yeah. for you. Um, so